Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Publishing with ECS, Editorial Tips for Submitting Your Best Work. I'm Shannon Reed, the Director of Community Engagement for the Electrochemical Society. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You may have joined using the, the presentation, listening using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join in over the telephone, select phone call in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You'll have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the Q&A pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We'll collect the questions and do our best to respond to them during the Q&A session after the presentation with time permitting. If we run out of time for the Q&A, we will publish an ECS news post with answers to the most asked questions. We'd also like you to mark your calendars. The 242nd ECS meeting takes place October 9th through the 13th, 2022 in Atlanta, Georgia. Registration is now open. Take advantage of the early registration discounts when you register by September 12th. The late abstract submission deadline is September 23rd, 2022. And we wanna give you a heads up about the spring meeting next year. The 243rd ECS meeting takes place May, May 28th through June 2nd, 2023, and is in conjunction with the 18th International Symposium on Solid Oxide Fuel Cells, SOFC. It's located in Boston, Massachusetts, and the abstract submission deadline is December 2nd, 2022. If you'd like more information about these meetings, visit electrochem.org, and I look forward to seeing you at a future ECS meeting. Now, I'd like to introduce today's speakers, Dr. Janine Maserol and Dr. Brett Lucht. Janine Maserol is professor of chemistry at McGill University. Her research focuses on topics ranging from electrochemistry in organic and biological media to electronically conducting polymers. She completed a PhD at the University of Texas at Austin in 2004 with Alan J. Bard, followed by a 2005 postdoc with Jean-Michel Savant. She was assistant, then associate professor at the University of Quebec, Montreal, from 2005 to 2011, and then returned to McGill in 2012 as an associate professor. Janine received the 2003 ECS Summer Fellowship and 2015 Chemical Society of Canada Fred Beamish Award. She is active in her scientific community, organizing and chairing conferences, including the 2020 Gordon Conference on Electrochemistry. Janine has made 100 presentations with 60 invited speaker invitations, serves on scientific committees, and has been a technical editor for the Organic and Bioelectrochemistry Topical Interest Area of the Journal of the Electrochemical Society since 2016. Janine was recently appointed technical editor for the Organic and Bioelectrochemistry Topical Interest Area of ECS Advances. Brett Lucht is professor at the University of Rhode Island. His research focuses on novel, novel electrolytes and electrolyte electrode interfaces for lithium ion battery applications, which includes extending the calendar life and improving low temperature properties of the performance of novel high capacity anodes, such as lithium metal or silicon, and performance of high voltage cathode materials. Brett's PhD in chemistry was awarded by Cornell University in 1996, after a postdoc at the University of California, he joined the University of Rhode Island in 1998. He is associate editor of the Journal of the Electrochemical Society and ECS Advances, as well as vice chair of the ECS Battery Division. He's published over 170 manuscripts, two book chapters, holds nine patents, and has been an invited or keynote speaker at over 100 companies, universities, national labs, and international conferences. Today, our esteemed editors, will provide an inside view into the ECS submission and peer review process and provide tips on preparing and managing a strong manuscript submission for publication consideration. Again, we welcome your questions, send them in at any time during the webinar using the Q&A feature. Our presenters will answer as many possible questions after their presentations. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Janine Maserol as our first speaker. Janine, take it away. Hi everyone, can you see my screen? Yep, we gotcha. And it's in presenter mode. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, well, uh, as uh, Shannon said, I'm from McGill University and um, it's my pleasure to discuss uh, publishing tips and I'll try to keep the presentation short such that we can actually have a discussion because uh, uh, what I'm about to say may not be exactly what um, you want to hear or uh, need answers. 
So McGill's in Montreal. Montreal is a really nice cosmopolitan uh, city in Canada. In the fall, uh, we have the beautiful colors. And in the winter, we have the beautiful snow. So it's not for everyone. And uh, my group, as Shannon said, works on uh, bioelectrochemistry, corrosion, batteries. As you probably know, if you're working in electrochemistry, it's a really diverse field. OK, so today, the objective of my section is to give you tips about how to build a strong submission package uh, when you're submitting to the ECS journals. Okay, a strong submission package has four elements. It has a cover letter, which should be maximum one page. It has a manuscript file, which in general should not have more than seven or eight figures. It can have a detailed supporting information file. And you also need to list uh, pertinent reviewers. Like these four elements, make for a very strong submission package. Now, be as succinct as possible. Time is precious. It's precious for you. It's precious for the reviewers. It's precious for the editors. And it's also precious for the reader. My number one suggestion to you in preparing your cover letter, your manuscript file, your supporting information, is to try to convey your message as succinctly as possible. Which, as you can tell from my accent, I'm, I am not a native English speaker. And so in the French language, being succinct is not really valued. <laughs> and so you sometimes have to learn and adapt your own, like writing style, which you've inherited in your, in your native language to scientific writing. Okay, the cover letter. For important things that we see in submission, addressing the letter to the editor, make sure you have the right name, gender and affiliation. It leaves a really bad impression if uh, you haven't done this most basic thing. Also, in the cover letter, there are a few elements that need to be there. The first paragraph should basically identify the title and the authors of your manuscript. It's important because editors manage a lot of manuscripts. And so based on the title, you can already tell whether or not uh, this work is fitting in the technical area of the ECS. If it isn't, then the editor can rapidly request a transfer to another TIA. Okay. And in this first paragraph, ask yourself, does my manuscript fit in the technical scope or the objective of the, the, the journal or the paper that you're trying to submit? Second paragraph should be composed of one sentence that summarizes the gap in the field that your work is filling. Are you developing a, a new method, a new molecule? Like you have to clearly identify the scientific gap that your work is filling. Second sentence should be one sentence that summarizes the novelty or the need for your work. Who will benefit from this? How will the scientific community grow based on the results that are presented in your manuscript? It, it needs to be succinctly and clearly explained. One sentence is the, uh, explaining the impact of the work in your field. And then finally, one sentence that summarizes why your work will be of interest to the journal's readership. Different journals have different types of readership. If um, you're submitting to analytical chemistry to uh, the Journal of Electrochemical Society, it's not the same population of scientists that are gonna be reading this journal. And so you have to motivate why your work is fitting within our particular journal and especially our particular TIA. The third paragraph should be a list of the specific key finding that your work is making. Okay. Here's an example. Okay. 
the previous paragraphs were more broad. The third paragraph needs to be very, very specific. For example, in, in this example, I say, okay, uh, we have three key contributions where the, we're developing a methodology that takes advantage of high surface roughness of thermally sprayed metal coatings to mitigate the need for additive primers. You know, so in that section of the, co of the cover letter, you can be more scientifically um, uh, specific about what are the contributions of your work. The fourth paragraph in the cover letter are important statements and thanks. An example of this would be like this. The manuscript file and figures have been uploaded to online submission system. All co-authors have read and approved the submitted manuscript and all authors declare no conflict of interest. This is really important and you, you actually have to make sure that this is the case, that you've done this. Finally, all work presented is original and has not been previously published in any other peer reviewed journal or has been submitted for publication elsewhere. It's really not appropriate to like submit two manuscripts in two different journals. Oftentimes like um, similar reviewers will be looking into these manuscripts and then you can, it can really lead to a bad impression if you decide to do this. You thank people for considering their work and you look forward to the response. You know, you have to realize that when you submit the manuscript, it, it takes like uh, several days and several weeks and the time of the reviewer. So it's always good to say to people and to say to people, thank you, you know, for uh, looking over my manuscript. All right, so that deals with the cover letter. The next item, in a strong submission package is the manuscript file. Now the manuscript file, the first part is the abstract, which kind of basically summarizes in a way like the key items that were highlighted in the cover letter, the gap, the need, the novelty, the specific contribution. This is oftentimes the first thing that people will read. Now the keywords that are requested uh, in an ECS submission, they are very helpful uh, for the editors in terms of identifying alternate reviewers from our networking pool, which uh, would have the required expertise to evaluate rapidly uh, your manuscript. So that's why choosing good keywords is a really important step in identifying the right reviewers for your manuscript. The manuscript uh, file uh, obviously has an introduction. It's important to only introduce what is absolutely necessary to support your claims, okay? And acknowledge others in the field. If your introduction is devoid of references or is overly long, it does not help your uh, manuscript during the review process. And the last paragraph of your introduction should basically tell the reader the organization of the manuscript, what's coming up, what uh, you're spilling the beans, but then that keeps the author basically, the reader interested. In the experimental section, all the information to reproduce your work is required to be included. Refer to protocols that are already published. This is uh, perfectly acceptable. You should have no results in this section. And then it's often useful to have titles in the experimental section to help guide the reader, especially, specifically if uh, you know there's a new graduate student that's trying to enter the field. They're using your manuscript in order to reproduce something that you've done. They might not be interested in reading the entire experimental section. And so by adding specific titles, if they're particularly interested in reproducing a microelectrode fabrication process or synthesizing a particular molecule, they will be rapidly able to find the information. This will lead uh, to a very positive view of your paper, which could then be used later on for citations, which is also very important uh, down the line. In the results section, you need to present each result. You cannot assume that the reader, the reviewer, or the editor will uh, automatically understand your result. You need to describe the result to the reader. On the x-axis, we have this. We have this on the y-axis. You uh, 
help the reader walk through your results and come to the same conclusion that you drew, are drawing in the manuscript. More than three to four data set on a single graph is really hard to digest. And so it comes back to this idea of being succinct and also um, choosing data that are representative of the entire study. Make sure that the figures are harmonized and like your manuscript is an entire file. So the tick labels, the font size, the axis label, it's very important to be um, very careful in your figure presentation. Figure captions accompany the figures and it's there it's important to write them in a way that they can almost be used as a standalone um, description of what their results are. It's okay if they're quite large. You can put a lot of information in terms of what each color means, the meaning of error bars, the number of replicates, important conditions. And so um, writing very nice detailed figure captions truly help uh, your manuscript because people will read it in different ways. They might not read it from like abstract experimental results, results and discussion. They might want to read your paper directly uh, with the uh, figure six and want to be able to understand what's the big conclusion and decide if they want to invest the time in reading your entire paper. Bad looking figures or uh, figures that are hard to interpret, overall they leave a really bad in impression and they reduce your chances for publication. So it's, it's really important to take the time to generate really nice looking figures. And then uh, especially specifically for um, uh, JES, if you're presenting uh, impedance data, you have to respect plotting conventions. Like for example, like the, an EIS Nyquist plot needs to be orthonormal. So it's very important to make sure that you're respecting plotting conventions in the figures that you are using. Uh, the, in the discussion section, uh, you discuss the meaning of the results, right? Some people write them separately, results and discussion, and then results and discussion in one. This is a very personal choice. It's important in the discussion se section to interpret and compare it and contrast to other work. If you're drawing a conclusion, it's really, if you can support it with a previous um, uh, study, uh, a, a, a reference, or if uh, actually your results are not in line, with what has been reported previously in literature. This may not be a, a bad thing. It may be like a, a something that needs to be discussed in the scientific community. You need to, to reference it because reviewers are going to be expert in the field and they are going to know other papers. And so if there's uh, discrepancies, if there's agreement, uh, you need to say it and reference it. Uh, all your arguments, uh, they need to be supported by experimental da data, modeling, or, or some kind of reference. If they're not, uh, this is how you identify whether or not you need to do an additional experiment. Oftentimes in the review process, this is what uh, makes the difference between minor revisions and major revisions. Uh, reviewers that feel that there's an experiment that's lacking to support a particular claim, they will request it and then it's assigned a major revision. Also, uh, you know, science and uh, our results, they're never perfect. There's always something, a doubt, uh, you know, a possibility that our interpretation um, might be slightly different if um, a certain condition was made. So it's important to acknowledge the shortfalls of the results or your interpretation. It's not negative, it's actually usually very uh, well um, received by reviewers and editors uh, when you have this perspective of saying, wait, this is my interpretation and is there any way that this could be wrong or could be interpreted slightly differently? And remember that the discussion section should be like a crescendo, right? You are building an argument and your last figure is the punchline. And so they, in a way, like your writing style needs to be enticing. The reader, the editor, the, re the reviewer, they need to want to continue to read uh, and get to that final part where the, the most exciting results are presented. 
The conclusion section summarizes the key finding. It's important not to copy and paste like what was said either in the abstract or in the discussion section, like the, the text need to be, it needs to be condensed. Uh, you definitely want, after summarizing the key findings, to explain how you can build on your work, expand a, a field or a topic. Uh, this is like useful not only for, for you, for your next step, but also for the community. And there is no greater compliment than if someone decides to like build or assign a project based on your work, right? That means that it's a really, truly great idea. You, so you explain the areas that still need to be explored. And it's important to present like a, a vision, right? The conclusion section needs to be inspiring. Um, it needs to say, okay, this is without overselling. And that's a very hard thing to write, which is why it's good to get your manuscript uh, reviewed by people that have been doing this for a long time. Okay, so now we had the, the one page max cover letter, one manuscript file with no more than seven or eight figures. And then you have the detail in the supporting information. The supporting information by definition, it's like all the information that's not critical to your argument, but is required uh, to support it. Uh, so for example, IR, NMR, scan rate analysis, modeling details, bio essays, all of this can be put in the supporting information and then you can refer to it in your main manuscript. If you have a file in the supporting information that you don't use in the main manuscript to support an argument, it shouldn't be there. Um, okay. Uh, and then finally, the list of pertinent reviewers. You know, this is actually very uh, important. All editors, they of course have access to a large bank of potential reviewers because we deal with so many papers. We we know uh, certain uh, reviewers in different fields, but uh, if you think a particular person is particularly well suited to review your manuscript, you should include it. However, you have to avoid all conflict of interest. You cannot have joint publications, joint funding, joint supervision. Uh, uh, with the person that you are recommending as a potential reviewer. If you do, it really leaves a very bad impression for like future publication history. You need to also think about geographical diversity in your choice. I'm in Canada. I cannot have six potential reviewers from Canada evaluating um, my personal manuscript. I like there are many people in the world that work on different areas, and if your uh, suggestions of per pertinent reviewers have some geographical diversity, this will also uh, impact the editor's opinion as to whether or not this is a good choice for a reviewer from you. Choosing young reviewers uh, often increases your chances of getting a fast reviews. Really established labs sometimes have like an enormous uh, amount of requests for manuscript reviews and there's 24 hours in a day. So make sure as well when you're suggesting potential reviewers that you have a range in terms of the uh, status of the, the researchers. Are they at a national lab, at a full profs? Are they assist assistant or associate profs and geographically distributed? In the end, right? Your objective is to find fair, rapid reviewers that will provide feedback on your manuscript. And then uh, please know that in the process of like handling your manuscript, the editors, they, they won't necessarily take all of the uh, pertinent reviewers that you've listed. They will also use alternate ones, which is why the keywords is still very important in helping us identify great reviewers for your manuscript. Okay, and so with this, um, like uh, I have a couple of questions that you can think about for the discussion um, later. Uh, so here they are, and I'm going to turn it over to Brett, uh, who's also um, has some tips uh, for you and uh, we can see uh, what's, uh, what he has prepared for us. On the slide. Okay, there we go. Okay, thank you very much, Janine. 
Uh, and like I, I, I'm going on to the post uh, submission process here. So you have spent all this time putting together your, your paper and you've submitted it. And so what happens next? And so basically, you know, this is, you know, for a lot of you, uh, something that you're not particularly familiar with. So a lot of what I'm going to go over is just really how the process works. So the first thing that happens after you, you put in your initial submission is that there's basically a... Uh, there is a uh, review by the ECS. So they check the formatting to make sure that everything's okay with the manuscript. At times, if there's some issue within the formatting of the manuscript, they'll send it back to you. You can correct these, these minor issues and then send it back. And then the first thing that happened is it's assigned to a technical area editor for a technical interest area uh, for the ECS. So the technical editor uh, will get this manuscript and a lot of technical uh, 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 TIAs, such as the one that I'm in, the battery uh, TIA, there's multiple associate editors. And so the technical editor will look at the manuscript and they have multiple associate editors that are working with them and they find which associate editor is the right person for this. And this can take uh, up to, these first two things can take up to about a week. And then when the uh, paper is assigned to an associate editor, the editor will conduct an initial review of the manuscript, uh, you know, usually reading through, say, the abstract or maybe the introduction, just kind of making sure the manuscript is appropriate for the journal. Uh, and then also doing a quick plagiarism check. Now, this is a really important thing to know is that basically there's an automated plagiarism checker that, that we as editors can just click on this thing and it gives basically uh, similarity factors for your paper compared to other papers that have been published. And so therefore, if there's a whole bunch of text that's the same as another paper, that's gonna come up and frequently as an editor, you can see this and you can go, well, either this is, you know, this is inappropriate or also, well, this paper is really very, very similar to something else that's already been published. You know, let's just say they're they're doping something with, with titanium instead of zirconium, but there's really nothing novel about it. And, and that might come up as a flag for a reason to, to reject the manuscript. Uh, so then uh, uh, the, the uh, after that, you start to look at all the possible reviewers. So the, as, as Janine said, basically there's, you can suggest reviewers. Uh, you could also say you don't want people to review. In addition to saying these are recommended reviewers, you can say you can list people that you do not want to review your paper. Uh, and then the, review, the editor will pick which, which of these reviewers that you suggested and also other reviewers that they suggest or, or come up on, you know, on ser from searching mechanisms. Uh, and then they send these out. And this process, once again, can take about a week. Uh, you know, the more people that are involved, uh, the longer things take, just because it may be that uh, one editor has time to, to assign the papers to, to, to the uh, associate editors and then the associate editor is doing something and then doesn't have a chance to look at it for a couple of days. I mean, it's, it's important to realize that you know, all of these editors uh, are doing this on a part-time basis. They all have other full-time jobs. Uh, and so therefore the amount of time that one can dedicate to these things uh, is when, when you have that time. And so it, you know, sometimes just papers come in and you may not get to it for a few days. Uh, so then upon uh, having these reviewers accept the assignment, uh, which the reviewers are re requested to re assign to, to respond within two weeks, uh, sometimes they respond, sometimes they don't, you know, it basically takes a couple uh, tries frequently to find reviewers. And then, uh, which I'll point out here, you know, the reviewers is something we always need more reviewers. And so especially for a lot of, you know, newer, younger researchers, uh, upper, you know, uh, later year grad students or also postdoctoral associates. Uh, if you're interested in reviewing uh, manuscripts, I would mention this to your advisor because a lot of times when, when papers come to very uh, prominent researchers that are really busy, but one of the options we also have is can you suggest other reviewers? And I've got a lot of very good, strong reviews and, and very timely reviews from both uh, upper, uh, upper year grad students, uh, senior grad students, and also postdoctoral associates. And so in general, you know, the time to first decision, which is what basically when we respond with, with what is on the next page, uh, is typically about a month, 30 to 35 days. So just so you know, when you submit something, typically you're not going to hear anything back from, from the journal for about a month. And so after the first decision, so the first decision is what comes back to you uh, from the editor. And there's basically these five different options uh, that you will see. The first one is accept without revision. So don't expect this. 
This is really rare. I've published 170 papers. And I think in the 170 papers that I've published, I've had one paper that was accepted without revision that just went straight through. This is not, this, this doesn't happen very often at all. Uh, usually what happens is something down here below, which is minor revision or major revision, which we'll go into more detail these on the next slide, reject, uh, which basically, you know, don't feel bad. Everybody gets papers rejected. I still get papers rejected, you know, all of the time. Uh, what you want to do is if you do get a paper rejected, you know, read the reviewer comments thoroughly and try to think, you know, calmly about what they're having to say. You know, think about how you can improve, improve the manuscript and then what other journal might be a better fit. Because if it's been rejected, you want to look for another journal, an alternative journal. It may be more specialized or it may be, you know, just to have a different slant uh, that's a better fit for your overall manuscript. And then finally, a new recent thing we have here at the ECS is the transfer. So there's a new journal, ECS Advances, uh, and this is multidisciplinary open gold access. And at times, if the, if the manuscript uh, may not be adequate for publication in the journal of the Electrochemical Society, it still may be a good high quality journal. And, and we as an editor may now transfer it to, this, to the ECS Advances. And so, uh, the manuscript revision. So for the cases where if you get the suggestion of major revision or minor revision, so that means you've been asked by the journal uh, to, or by the editor, to revise your manuscript. So when you do this, okay, so you're going to get comments back from the reviewers, which is, you know, anywhere between two and maybe three or four reviewer comments that you might get back. So when you do this, read the reviewer comments. And then I encourage you to step away from the comments and the manuscript for at least a day, because a lot of times these reviewer comments are negative comments about your manuscript, which you spend a lot of time working on this manuscript. And you may go, oh, my God, I can't believe that they think this, that or the other thing. Oh, I'm, I'm really upset. So take 24 hours away from it, then go back and reread the reviewer comments again and read them thoroughly and try and remain calm. And then reread the sections of your manuscript that are related to the comments. A lot of times reviewers' comments are related to things just not being clearly presented. And while you did the work and you wrote the paper so everything's clear to you, if it wasn't clear to the reviewer, which is a person that is an expert in the field of what you're doing, then clearly you may not have just stated it the best you could have. And so reread the paragraph and try and go back and, and, and emphasize uh, something slightly different so that it makes more sense to the reviewer. Then go back, draft your response letter to the reviewer comments, and then also revise the manuscript. Make sure that your responses are professional and appropriate. You know, don't send a nasty gram back. You doing that's not going to do you any favors. Uh, it's not going to do, you know, the editor is not going to be necessarily pleased with it. The reviewer is not going to be pleased with it. Uh, and then after you've you know made put together things, reread it one more time, response and the manuscript, and then upload it and submit it back to the journal. So for example, though, with these response letters, okay, so when you do your response, your responses should be short and to the point, and you should clearly indicate what changes have been made to the manuscript. So you see there's some example response letters from responses that I wrote. So the comment here from, from a reviewer, it's particularly interesting that these formulations contain FEC, blah, blah, blah. You know, what, what expand the discussion related to the difference in performance. Okay, so that's what the question is, the comment from the reviewer. I go response. If you notice, I have these two things highlighted in different colors. So it's clear to see what the, the, the reviewer said and clear to see what your response is. And then what we say is the following sentences and reference were added to page seven. Tells you where it is in the manuscript to clarify the role of FEC. I quote exactly what sentences were indicated, which were, which were indicated, and show the reference that was added. So once again, you want to clearly say, "Oh, here was the issue that was that was mentioned by the reviewer. We understand that's an issue. We've reread the manuscript. Here's that we, we are going to make a change. Here's what the change is, and here's how we've clarified things." At the same time, you don't always have to change the manuscript. There are cases where, let's say here, this is a second comment, you know, given the evidence of generation of these acidic species, you know, why coulombic efficiency in some of these cells remains so high as shown in figure one, can this aspect also be explained quantitatively? It's a great question. It was a great comment. However, the way that we were doing the experiments at the time, we couldn't really do it any more quantitatively than we were already doing it. We were doing the best job we could. 
And so we come back and the response is the relationship between Coulombic efficiency and blah, 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 sorry, Coulombic efficiency and capacity loss is complicated. The Coulombic efficiencies in figure one are lower for cells, blah, blah, blah. We cannot provide a more quali a quantitative explanation at this time. No change was made to the manuscript. So if you, if you respond to a person's comment, respond concisely. And if you don't make a change, specifically state, we didn't make a change to the manuscript. A lot of times when you see these reviewer comment, you know, responses to reviewer comments, people will kind of ramble on for a hundred words, but then not even say if they made a change or not. They're just kind of rebutting what the person's saying. You know, that's not what the, what the goal of these rebuttal letters are. The goals are, okay, here's what your comment was. Here's what my, you know, what, what my response is. And here's the change or the lack of change that I made to the manuscript and why. And it should be relatively short. The other thing, once again, as you can see here, the, the, the comment is in one color. The response is set off and in a separate color. So it's very clear what's, what's from the reviewer and what's the response to the reviewer's comments. And use, you know, when you're doing these things, use, use fonts and colors that are easy to read. I just got a rebuttal letter. Uh, last weekend, where basically they used black lettering and then highlighted it in gray behind it, and it was almost impossible to read what the what the what the uh, uh, the author was saying. So try and make this easy for both the editor to review, read through all the rebuttal comments, and then also the reviewers read through the rebuttal comments. And so then after this is what you resubmit the paper, the revisions. Uh, there may be two rounds of this. They may suggest more revisions, but then eventually. The paper is either rejected or the paper is accepted. When the paper is accepted, the final stage of thing is the proofs. So basically, you get the galley proofs of the of the manuscript, which is now uh, all uh, online. Now, once again, with this, take your time. This is your last time to review the manuscript. You want to read it slowly and carefully. I know for all, for most all of you at this time, you've read the manuscript 20 or 30 times and you really don't want to read it again. I know that, that's how I feel. Uh, but nonetheless, this is the last time you have to read it. You don't have to read the paper again, but it's the last time to make sure that you don't have any errors, small errors, typographical errors, misstatement things. So read through it carefully to make any corrections at this last time. Uh, and especially looking out for, you know, watching out for typographical errors that might be there, because what you don't want to have to do is then go back and publish a correction to the manuscript. And so with that, that's the end of all that I had to say. Uh, and we'll pass it back and we'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Great. Thanks, Brett and Janine. So we do have a question and answer session for everybody. Uh, let me, hang on one second, uh, get those set up. Um, before we jump into the question and answer session, I was actually able to load the poll um, that wasn't available earlier. So we'd love to understand some of the audience demographics before we get into um, the question and answer session. So if you could, um, please take a moment to respond to the three questions that are um, currently launched in the poll. The first question is, what geographical region are you joining us from today? Africa, Europe, the Middle East, Asia, North America, South America, or Australia? And then uh, identifying your career stage. Are you an undergraduate student, PhD, postdoc, or early career researcher? early career industry employer, entrepreneur, or senior career subject matter expert? And then lastly, have you or do you plan on publishing with ECS within the year? Yes, no, considering, or you're still unsure. We'll give everyone a few seconds to respond. So if you could, please just uh, select those options on your screen. And while this is coming in, it looks like we have a lot of attendance here from Europe and North America. Uh, quite a few PhD students, uh, postdoc and uh, subject matter experts. So thank you for joining us. And then um, publishing within the year. So 50% of the attendees today uh, 
have planned or are planning on publishing with ECS uh, this year. So that's great news. Um, and then the, about the other half are considering. So awesome. Thank you guys uh, for that uh, information. And so let's go ahead and get started with the Q&A session. Um, so Brett and Janine, a couple of questions for you. Um, I'm going to go with a few of the questions from the audience first. So Janine, there was a particular slide uh, related to paragraph four. Um, and Sven asked, uh, can the example for paragraph four be used uh, because the content seems to be very similar for every submission? So I'm not sure, does, does that question make sense from what you presented? Yeah, so I think maybe it's like the thanks you know, okay. uh, paragraph. So for sure, this information needs to be in the cover letter, you know, and there's a, this is your writing. So it's normal that between cover letters, right, this paragraph is going to look very similar, but that information needs to be in there. So like many times, what will change is going to be like this specific uh, key contributions of that particular manuscript and the gap in the field, but the, the title, authors, and the thanks, and all the information, that can be very similar, no problem. Great. And then another one came in. Uh, Brett, this was during your uh, presentation. Um, Fee is wondering uh, if you might have or might know of any free software to check plagiarism uh, that maybe a, a, an author could use on their end before submitting. You know, I, I, I don't know of any. And in fact, I tried to do this myself and, and looked and did, did an internet search uh, to try and find some uh, free uh, plagiarism software and downloaded a couple of things, but I, I was not able to find uh, something that worked very well. I'm sorry. <laughs> Gotcha. Yeah, but no worries. Like, oftentimes, like uh, if you're reading a paper and suddenly the the, the style changes significantly, uh, like uh, it, the editors and reviewers will just copy paste this sentence and put it into Google, and then lo and behold, it can like pop up one of the articles. So that's a very good way of actually checking whether or not. Um, in your work, when you were writing, you got two inspired by another paper. And so you can ask a, a colleague, you can ask your prof, right, to check. And this is sometimes very apparent in the English style that's used in the manuscript. Especially in intros, introductions. You know, a lot of times, because, you know, I, I study lithium batteries, you know, most of your lithium battery paper introductions are pretty similar. <laughs> There's a lot of similarities, but that's that's one place, you know, where a lot of times, especially newer scientists, younger scientists, that when they're doing things, they're kind of looking at other papers and not intending to plagiarize, but a lot of the language overlaps. Oh, yeah. And Adrian, sorry, everybody. We also have Adrian yeah, Plummer, who is the ECS Director of Publications on the webinar today, too. Adrian. I was just going to, to chime in there. I would every, every university institution is different. Um, and I would encourage some here. And if you're I know in the US, it's pretty common. Some of the libraries will have access to um, systems like Turnitin. If you're using things like Blackboard, um, our system here within ECS is Authenticate, which is pretty a pretty commonly used tool. Sometimes those university librarians can be of assistance in helping with um, submitting a paper um, on your behalf um, prior to your submission to do that check and, and get a comparison check. It will not be universal, um, but I would encourage to check in with your librarians um, on your within your institutions to see if those resources may be available on an ad hoc basis. Great, awesome. All right, so let's move on to the next question. So Janine, this was one of the questions that you asked the audience to ponder um, at the end of your presentation related to the manuscript submission. So uh, let's start with the first one. How do you know if your cover letter is good? Okay, well, th the thing is that uh, when you're writing, it's never going to be perfect and it will improve with time. And sometimes you're venturing out in a very different field, you know? So to make sure your cover letter is good, you want other people to read it, right? People that are not directly involved in your project, lab members, supervisors, committee members, you know? And 
if you actually just print it out and bring it to people, they should be able to read it within two to five minutes and understand what you're saying. And if you go to the office with the paper and someone cannot understand it or can't tell you in their own words, what's novel, what's the gap, what's the key finding, then you know your cover letter is not good because like it will take two to five minutes for us to read the, the letter and we won't spend more time doing this or wonder what it is that you're trying to say. It has to be very clearly stated. So ask many people, this makes a huge difference. And ask people that care about you, right? Because it takes time. If people care about you, your progress, yeah, you know, they will take the time to read it. Great. Um, and uh, I think this one, uh, Janine or Brett, uh, or both of you can respond. Um, another from Fee. Uh, is there a, a formatting style or resource for all main manuscript um, and SI figure and table submissions that people can resource? Uh, so the, a lot of the journals have like templates, you know, which can either be word format or, or latex. So you can use this, you know, also there's a, there's your personal style, right? So like there's author guidelines as well. So first like read the author guidelines, then find a paper in your field that, you know, uh, you like or you thought was very efficient and you can start working from there. Uh, people in the group usually share templates and supporting information as well, you know? So I think there's no problem in asking for help and working off of somebody else's template. Uh, as long as uh, you change the text significantly. I don't know if Brett has a, a different um, no, opinion, I, but starting from scratch takes a really, really long time, you know? So ask for help. People will share this with you. They remember what it's like preparing their first paper. Yeah, no, I, I certainly agree with that. And, and with, with, you know, there, there are templates for most of these journals, for many journals. Uh, however, you know, in terms of the text and the figures, I mean, there's there's text and there's figures, and you want it in a readable format so that it's easily visually retrievable. You don't want to use, you know, eight point font and things like that. Uh, but then also, especially in terms of the SI, the SI is not really reformatted. So if you go online and look at the SI for various other papers that are published by other similar researchers to you, uh, that's you can do it. They use the exact same format that they do. I mean, with with the actual publications. The papers are reformatted by ECS to, to put it into their formatting thing. But even with it, the main thing is text figure, text figure, text figure. And you want the text legible and the figures legible and the figure captions legible and the numbers and writing in the figure legible. If you can't see all those things, I mean, that's the most important thing is that you can actually read all those numbers and words. Great, yeah, thank you. And I do know, um, I'm actually gonna share my screen really quickly. Um, if the audience is interested, because I know many people said that they were interested in submitting to an ECS journal. We do have journal submission instructions on the ECS website. So if you go to publications and then resources, you can click on this link right here, journal submission instructions, and it'll even explain um, the information that's on the page. So the journal policies, general text requirements, figure requirements, all that kind of good stuff. So feel free to peruse that resource as well um, when you're when you're looking at submitting to an ECS journal. Um, Janine, I think I have another question for you. Um, and you mentioned this during the presentation. So what can someone do uh, if they're not a native English speaker, knowing that English is the is the language of science, right? Yeah, it's um, that is very difficult, you know, and you have to acknowledge that the um, English speakers in your group, reading them, you being like, you can develop a methodology. For example, in French, it's common to have a sentence that has five lines, okay? Like it's a, but in scientific writing, you don't do this. So you, at some point are going to know what are your weaknesses in scientific writing. So you write them down and you systematically check every sentence. Does this sentence have five lines? Yes, I need to cut it down to one or two. You know, in a way, if you're a non-native English speaker, 
you have to be very disciplined about changing your style and you need to have your paper read by non-native, uh, by, by native English speakers who care about you again, because like providing feedback on uh, your paper takes a lot of time. Also, people rarely want to give you negative feedback when they know you, you know, so you have to tell them like, I want to improve, tell me one thing. So uh, unfortunately, a lot of it comes from you. You can take writing classes if, if depending on, on your level of English, but it will never be perfect. It's something that you need to work on for years, you know, and I still send some of my papers to my native English students who correct me and I'm perfectly fine with this. So, you know, just be humble, do the best that you can and try. Uh, there's also a really good book that's like a, called Writing Like a Chemist. I don't know if Brett, you've uh, looked at that before, but uh, it, it's very helpful for non-native uh, English speakers to improve your style. You know, you're not gonna get it right straight off the bat. It takes time and discipline. You also add there, that there are uh, services out there for technical writing where you can, you can I mean, they're not free, uh, but you can submit your manuscript to places where they can help clean up the English language. That's true, but they don't really care about you. And that does not help you in the long run become a better scientific writer, which I think is the goal here. Great. Um, and then, Brett, you had mentioned in your presentation, and, and Janine, this was also one of your questions, um, about identifying reviewers. So uh, in your experiences, uh, can you talk a little bit about, a little bit more, um, Brett, I know you covered this quite a bit, um, about how you identify reviewers for your papers and, and maybe um, something our audience members could do, uh, do more of when they're submitting to our journals? Okay. Yeah. So, so basically, you know, people suggest reviewers. That's one thing. And they're required. You're required to suggest at least four reviewers. Uh, and you know, what I would suggest is when you're within your paper, you should you know read reread your paper and and look at the people you're citing, because the people that you're citing in the paper are likely to be people that should be able to review the manuscripts. So that's one place when you're looking for suggested reviewers. Uh, another thing with suggested reviewers is. You know, I would avoid listing the biggest names in the field as suggested reviewers. And the main reason for this is those people are extremely busy. Whenever I ask those people to review papers, they very rarely say yes. I mean, occasionally, but I mean, that's just not. So everybody's naming the same top few people in the field. So what you want to do is find people that are kind of really working in the specific area that you're working in. And once again, if they're newer, younger researchers, that's very good because they may have the time to do it. Now, so when I start picking other researchers, so once again, my I'm an expert in batteries and I know a lot of people. And so when I read through the paper, read through, I read through the abstract of the paper and read through the, the introduction, what I can do is go, well, I know these three or four people, they might be good reviewers. But then also within the system that we have uh, as editors, it, it lists a whole bunch of other recommended reviewers. And so we can go through that list and pick people that way also. Also, when you go to conferences, I mean, I know a lot of the responsibility falls on you, but you want to network. You, if, you, if you go and hear a talk in an area that's going to be very close to the area where you're going to be uh, submitting, you want to go introduce yourself. You want like, to, take, to, to, to try to get this person to remember you such that when the editor says, hey, I got this great paper from Shannon, are you willing to you know, spend an entire afternoon reviewing this person's paper? It's uncomfortable, especially for graduate students and postdocs, but you know, people like meeting new researchers, right? So that's another way to identify reviewers. Every time you go to a conference, if this person is slightly related to your work, force yourself to go tell them what you're doing and then suggest them as reviewers. Great, um, thank you for that. Can I ask Janine a quick question? Yeah, of course, go for okay. it. Okay, so, so in, in, your, in your presentation, you mentioned that you should you know, have seven or eight figures. So is it okay to have figure one A through F and figure two A through N? 
the thing is you don't want any of the results to be repetitive i don't know if you like if if the point is just to show that it's reproducible you know you can have one figure and then use the si to demonstrate this so it's totally okay brett i think to have like you know a four-part figure but if it's like a seven-part figure you know you have to ask yourself is every panel really required for me to make the argument you know and I don't know, above four panels, I, I find that the figure becomes too convoluted. I don't know if that's your opinion too, you know, because in batteries, people tend to put like charge discharge curves like crazy, right? Yeah, no, I agree. <laughs> Great, we've got a lot of questions coming in y'all. So we'll try to get to as many as we can before um, we reach the top of the hour. Um, Great. Uh, so from Allison, uh, just submitted a question. So do you suggest reviewers need to be pre-existing reviewers in ECS's network or other publishers, or can they be newbies? Newbies. We love newbies, actually. You know, the most important thing is, is the person going to really take time to read your paper? Because the last thing you want is a reviewer that says, oh, this is generally good. You know, you want somebody that reads your paper, that provides comment, and that tells the editor, hey, this, this was a very good review. I should consider accepting this. And then uh, somebody that's timely, right? Because you care about publishing your paper as quickly as possible and graduating. Absolutely. Great. Um, I have a question related to figures and text um, in ECST. Uh, so maybe uh, Janine and Brett, if you're not familiar with the question, maybe Adrian can pop on and, and answer. Um, and the, the attendee is asking, uh, what about figures and text that are published in ECS transactions? Can those be reused for submissions in peer-reviewed ECS journals? I can take that. Um, ECS, um, in terms of, I want to just maybe first highlight that anything that we are citing, whether it's from an ECS journal or another one should be referenced properly. Um, but ECS will not require the layer of permissions um, when you're published in an ECS transactions manuscript um, versus JES or JSS, but your citations would still need to be in alignment. Um, whether, you, what, whether you are, I think Brett mentioned this, whether you are self-citing, um, from something that you've published in the past, you would still need to reference it properly, but you would not be required to get permissions from transactions to, to JES, from transactions to JSS or so on. I hope that clarifies the question or answer, I should say. Yeah, great. Thanks, Adrian. I'm glad uh, we have you here today to help with those types of <laughs> questions, right? Um, and then we have one more question, again, from Fee. Uh, uh, this one uh, in their manuscript, and Adrian, you just uh, did a shout out to this. Uh, should they cite or add their own publication in the reference um, to show that uh, the work is either continuing or part of some other works that they've done before? Um, I would certainly, I, I see Janine nodding and I would agree, but I would also mention it's always healthy to cite, um, but I'm going to do a shameless plug here that ECS is a member of the Center on Publication Ethics. Anything that you're citing in relationship to the manuscript should be related to the work that you're publishing. Um, it should be helpful to you know the work that you're that you're extending upon, but motivated by that and not by just adding the citation for to to count the citation to your published work. Um, I, I have to say that in my role. <laughs> But also the thing that's important is that coming back to the novelty, right? If you have worked in this field before, like Brett was saying, okay, doping with titanium versus with nickel, you know, you want to tell the reviewer and the editor, I, I've done this before, but here's what's new in this new manuscript. This is really, really important because otherwise it's easy for a reviewer to say, well, you know, like, why is it that doping with nickel is so much more interesting than titanium, right? You, you have to anticipate what, how the body of your work is going to be received. Yeah, but make, I mean, most importantly, make sure and cite. You know, don't, I mean, you don't, don't oversight and especially don't oversight yourself. Uh, but don't, you know, if, if you have something, I mean, you should never make a statement in the paper that says, well, you know, as previous researchers have shown, and then not follow it with a citation. If you're going to make some statement like that, you need to at least have some citation that shows that somebody's done it. 
Great. Well, I think I want to I want to be respectful of everybody's time. I mean, I know we are at the top of the hour, so um, let, we'll go ahead and wrap up the Q and A session. I don't see any other outstanding questions. Uh, so with that, I want to give a thank you to Brett and Janine and Adrian for joining us today. Um, I do want to highlight a couple of other programs that we have coming up for the audience. So give me one second to reshare my screen. Get in presentation mode. Uh, the ECS Great webinar experience. series. Yeah, no problem. Um, we're happy to do this. Uh, so as you can see, the ECS webinar series is scheduled out through the end of the year uh, with our topics. We know that this is a great way for the community to get involved, um, especially as we uh, still transition out of COVID um, and, and whatnot. So next up in the ECS webinar series is the challenges facing lie-ion battery electrolytes and high energy cathodes on September 21st with Dr. Wesley Dose. So if you are interested in registering for that, please visit electrochem.org forward slash webinars. The recording of today's webinar will be available on the ECS YouTube channel within the next few days. We encourage you to recommend the webinar to your colleagues and share the recording on your social media accounts. Make sure to tag ECS. This is a great way to promo um, your engagement with the society. And again, you know, a, a big thank you to Brett, Janine, and Adrian. We re really value your time and your effort and your commitment to the community. So thank you for taking the time today uh, to share information about publishing with ECS and, and tips and whatnot. Uh, with that, I also want to thank the audience for joining us today. And the webinar is now over. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.